All right, now the next case. This was a mask from the hand of a, a middle-aged uh, adult. And it kind of slowly growing and diffusely swelling the hand. And so they went in and took a biopsy from it. You can see dense connective tissue here and inflammation. But then in these pieces, there is a neoplasm. And it's sheets of large um, cells that have abundant pale pink cytoplasm, large pleomorphic atypical nuclei, and the chromatin is very pale and washed out, very vesicular. Look at how loose and open that chromatin is. Um, and these large pleomorphic cells with very pale chromatin and abundant dense pink cytoplasm on the distal extremity of a young adult or a middle-aged adult, what's this diagnosis gonna be until proven otherwise? What's the first thing you should think of here? You can type in the chat if you would like. And then some inflammation here. So this is an example of, I'll, actually I'll show you the stains first before we go further. And then we'll talk about it. Here's a keratin stain strong, diffuse expression of pancyter keratin in the cytoplasm there. Here's an EMA. Occasionally keratin doesn't work as well for this tumor, but EMA will. So I feel like it's, a, it's decent and reasonable to do both of them if you're suspecting this. And then further support, this is INI1, also known as SMARTB1. And you can see this is one of those uh, stains where negative staining is what matters, loss of expression in the tumor nuclei. And whenever you have one of those stains, whether it's one of the microsatellite instability markers or whatever, you have to make sure your internal control work really well. Because otherwise, if the stain fails, you could in, in, inappropriately consider it that to be a loss of expression, and then you could make uh, the wrong diagnosis. So I do think that INI1 is a little bit of a tricky stain. I feel like it should stain most of the nucleated cells in the body with the exception of the tumors that have INI1 or SMARTB1 loss. But um, I do think sometimes, see, it's not like super strong, crisp staining in all the background cells. And this has been in multiple labs, I found this to be the case. But usually when it's lost in the tumor cells, it's obvious. Look at that. You can clearly tell these big atypical cells are definitely negative when you compare them with the background lymphocytes, right? This is what you're looking for. Total wiped out loss in the tumor nuclei as opposed to the background normal control, okay? The, the endothelial cells or the inflammatory cells. So this tumor is of course epithelioid sarcoma and these often arise on the distal extremities of young adults, the conventional type. There's also a proximal type that is more ugly and kind of rhabdoid looking, very, very um, obviously malignant and uh, tends to occur uh, more proximally like in the groin or close to the trunk. Um, and in any case, these are important tumors to know about. They're very rare, but unfortunately they do often afflict young people and children as well sometimes. And they tend to be locally aggressive and eventually metastasize in many cases. So they're very serious diagnosis. And some cases can be quite subtle and kind of more spindled. They can ha have a low power appearance that has necrosis in the center with tumor cells around the outside that closely mimics rheumatoid nodule or deep granuloma annulari. So I always try to keep in mind whenever I see a rheumatoid nodule or a deep granuloma annulari, I try to always ask myself, could this be epithelioid sarcoma? I've just made that a habit to ask in the hopes that I never miss a subtle case. Because I have seen some subtle cases that were not this atypical that closely mimicked rheumatoid nodule and low power. And that is a really treacherous pitfall to fall into. So in any case, that's how we make the diagnosis. Remember that um, uh, INI1 is lost in a growing list of other tumors. You can go look that up online and see the list of various other entities that can have loss of INI1. So it's not a totally specific thing. It has to look like epithelial sarcoma, be the right clinical setting, and make sure that it doesn't fall into one of the other categories, okay? Um, also do remember that um, uh, about half of epithelial sarcomas can stain with, with ERG. And ERG is a great vascular marker. It's very sensitive and usually pretty crisp and clean, but it is not totally specific. It can stain a variety of other entities. So sometimes you are, it might have the differential between an epithelioid sarcoma and an epithelioid angiosarcoma. Both of them can be keratin positive and both of them can be ERG positive. So do keep that in mind that if you're thinking about a vascular thing, 
just remember that this will sometimes stain or oftentimes will stain with ERG and don't mistake this for a malignant vascular tumor, okay? So in any case, epithelioid sarcoma. And um, this uh, oftentimes, these a lot of times end up leading to amputation, not always, but unfortunately a lot of times they do. In this case, the tumor was resected without amputation and I don't know long-term how the patient did, but these do have a tendency to recur um, over time, sometimes over many years, can recur again and again, metastasize up the arm. I've seen ones that had kind of almost a sporotrichoid kind of pattern of cutaneous metastases. They tend to metastasize the lymph nodes, so they behave differently than a lot of other sarcomas, and uh, again, a really bad tumor. Um, here is the gross photograph of the resection of this case. That was the biopsy, the resection. This is what, uh, what it looked like, a very fleshy tumor here. And you can see filling up the subcutaneous adipose tissue and infiltrating down and mingling in between the, um, the fascia and the tendon sheath. And uh, obviously because of where these arise and because of how infiltrated they can be, can be very difficult to eradicate them surgically, which is why a lot of times, unfortunately, the patients do end up having to get amputations eventually.